Okay, guys, so I'm starting a new revision series targeted at chemical families, specifically alkali metals, alkaline arc metals, and halogens. Now, in chemistry, a chemical family is a group of elements that have the same number of valence electrons and therefore similar physical and chemical properties. In our lesson today, we are going to do a deep, deep dive on alkali metals such that by the end of the two part lessons, you are going to be ripe. So let's dive into it. So, what are the alkali metals? These are elements that belong to group one of the periodic table. Now, in the case of the periodic table, elements are arranged in groups and periods. So, in groups, you're going to have elements that have the same number of valence electrons. Valence electrons are electrons that are found on the outermost energy level. So as you can tell from our members, we have lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium. But usually the focus is on the first three, lithium, sodium, and potassium. Now as you look at this, you can clearly see we have the atomic number. This is the number of protons. So in any atom, by the way, any atom, no matter what it is, the number of protons will always be equal to the number of electrons. So in the case of sodium, let's say, we have 11 protons, as can be seen by the atomic number. That indicates we are also going to have 11 electrons. So these electrons are going to be arranged in their respective energy levels. So we're going to have two electrons going into the first energy level. So this energy level can only take a maximum of two. We're going to remain with nine, but the second energy level can only take a maximum of eight. So eight go in there. How many are we remaining with? One, and this goes in the outermost energy level. And therefore, sodium has one valence electron. By the way, guys, I'm not going to discuss how electrons are arranged in the energy level. This is something that I've already done in a previous video. So if you want to check it out, it's under valences. By the way, something that you will have to note is this. Elements that have the same number of electrons in the outermost energy level, that is the same number of valence electrons, are going to have similar chemical properties. Why? Because it's the valence electrons that determine how that particular element reacts with other components. Now, guys, let us get into it, okay? That was just an introduction. Now, let us talk about the atomic radius. So, what is the atomic radius? Simply defined, atomic radius is simply the distance from the center of the atom to the outermost energy level as such. That is the atomic radius. So essentially, the atomic radius is simply a measurement of the size of the atom. Atoms that have a small atomic radius are going to have a small atom. Those that have a larger atomic radius are going to have larger atoms. So whenever I talk about um, a small atomic radius, a large atomic radius, I'm simply referring to the size of the atom itself. Now, in this case, which of these three is going to have the smallest atomic radius? That, my dear students, is lithium. And this is obvious because the number of energy levels determines the size of the atom. So in the case of lithium, lithium has only two energy levels. In the case of sodium, it has three. Potassium has four. As you can clearly see, we are having a certain trend. The number of energy levels are increasing from one member to the next. And as such, we are going to have an increase in the size of the atom. So the atomic radius increases down the group. So when you talk about down the group, simply meaning moving from lithium to sodium to potassium as such, we are going to have an increase in the atomic radius. The reason the atoms are increasing in size due to an increase in the number of energy levels. Okay, what about the ionic radius? Now, in the case of the ionic radius, again, this is the distance from the center of the ion to the outermost energy level. Now, what is an ion? An ion is a charged particle that is formed when an atom either loses or gains electrons. Now, guys, let's talk about elements. Out of all the elements that are present, and I'm talking about the different elements, you know, sodium, potassium, chlorine, fluorine, um, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, you know, everything, yeah? Out of all the elements that are present, the ones that are stable are those that belong to group 8. I'm talking about the normal gases, you know, akina, helium, neon, argon. These are the stable ones. 
And why am I referring to them as being stable? It's because they have full energy levels. Yani zimeja. The energy levels that they have have the maximum number of electrons they could possibly have. Let's take an example of helium. Helium has the atomic number of two. So if it has two protons, it will definitely have two electrons. Now, both of these two electrons are going to go into the first energy level. Now, remember, the first energy level can only take a maximum of two. So this is already stable. It's full to the maximum. Neon has an atomic number of 10. So 10 electrons. If we arrange them into the respective energy levels, we get an electronic configuration of 2, 8. Again, second energy level can take a maximum of 8. So this is full. And as such, these are stable. So they have atoms that are stable. You know, as in a stress, they are in most cases unreactive. But as for the rest, they are unstable because their energy levels are not full. If you look at the alkali metals, we're having lithium 2 1, sodium 2 8 1. And we know that if we want to have stable atoms, they need to be full up to the brim with eight electrons. Is that the case here? Of course not. So these atoms are unstable. Atoms that are unstable will seek to gain stability by either losing or gaining electrons. Now, in the case of metals such as these, it's easier for them to lose. Just look at them. It's easy for them to lose the single valence electron and become stable. So in the case of lithium, lithium loses its one valence electron to have an electron configuration of two. So one is lost. Same goes for sodium. Sodium forms an electron configuration of 2, 8 by losing its one valence electron. Again, to potassium, 2, 8, 8. So as you can clearly see, in the case of the alkali metals, how do they become stable? By losing their one valence electron. Now, when atoms lose an electron, they are no longer considered to be atoms. They are now called ions. And ions are charged. They will either have a positive charge or a negative charge. Now, my dear students, let us come back to this. I want you to look at the sodium atom. How many electrons does the sodium atom have? 11. How many protons? 11. What is the charge of a proton? It's a positive charge. Electrons are negatively charged. So if we have 11 protons, that means we have a positive charge of 11 in the nucleus of an atom. If we have 11 electrons in the orbitals, we have a negative charge of 11. So in the sodium atom, plus 11 minus 11 gives you zero. The atom is neutral. So all atoms of any element will always be neutral because the number of protons equals the number of electrons. But to Mesema, they may be neutral, but they are unstable. And for them to gain stability, they need to lose or gain electrons. In the case of metals, they will lose their valence electrons. So what happens when sodium loses its valence electrons? You're going to have a decrease in the number of electrons. So the number of electrons decreases by 1 because the valence electron was lost. So it decreases from 11 to 10. What about the number of protons? The number of protons is not affected. It remains the same. So we are going to end up having a positive charge of 11, a negative charge of 10 in the ion that has been formed. What is the overall charge? Plus 1. Why? Because you're going to have one more proton than electron. So the overall charge is positive. And that is the reason why a sodium ion is illustrated as such. Na plus. So the plus represents a positive charge of 1. Now guys, I want you to make two observations here. Observation number one has to do with the difference between the atomic radius and the ionic radius of every element. So compare that of lithium. If you were to compare the atom of lithium with its ion, you will note that the lithium ion is smaller than the lithium atom. And this is the same for sodium and potassium. Why? Because when it comes to formation of an ion, it's going to lose its valence electron. And by doing so, it loses the outermost energy level. So that is observation number one. Observation number two is that when we talk about the ionic radius, what will happen is that you're going to notice that 
the trend of the ionic radius down the group increases. This simply means that if you compare the ionic radius of lithium to that of sodium, you will note that sodium has a larger ionic radius than lithium. Same goes for potassium. Out of these three, potassium has the largest ionic radius, followed by sodium and lastly, lithium. So this can clearly be explained by the increase in the number of energy levels. So in the ion, lithium has one energy level. Sodium has two. Potassium has three. And as such, the potassium ion is going to be the largest of the three. Now, guys, I have been talking about lithium losing electrons, potassium losing an electron. You know such that alkali metals lose electrons in order to become stable. What do we mean by losing electrons? Is this something that just happens out of the blue? You know, like potassium is like, ah, I feel like, I, you know, it's time. Let me just get rid of this valence electron. Uh, it doesn't happen like that. It happens during chemical reactions. So when you have, for example, potassium reacting with something else, then that is where the loss of electrons happens. And these electrons that are lost don't just disappear into the atmosphere or anywhere else. They are actually transferred from the alkali metals to another component. So when you talk about loss, they're not really lost. They're just moved from their atoms to another element. Now, this process requires energy because you're literally forcing the electrons to move out of the atoms. Already remember, the electrons are going to have uh, a state whereby they are highly attracted to the positive nucleus. Now, in an atom, you have the center containing the protons. This is known as the nucleus. So the nucleus is positively charged due to the presence of the protons. Electrons are found orbiting the nucleus. Electrons are negatively charged. What do we know about oppositely charged particles? They attract one another. So electrons are going to be attracted towards the nucleus. Do you want to remove the electron? Yes. Then you are going to need energy to remove the electron from where it's attracted to the nucleus. Now, this energy that is used for the removal of an electron from an atom is what is referred to as ionization energy. So, any, any atom that loses electrons requires ionization energy. But the amount of energy that is required differs from one atom to another. Okay. So, for example, in the case of alkali metals, they will all require ionization energies. That is, they will require energy to remove their valence electron. But the amount differs from lithium to sodium and potassium. And this depends on the size of the atom and the force of attraction present between the electrons and the protons. Okay, guys. Let's start with lithium. Out of these three, lithium is the smallest. And if it's the smallest, what will happen is that its electrons are going to be quite close to the nucleus. So you're going to have a very strong force of attraction between the negatively charged electrons and the positively charged nucleus, okay? So if you want to remove the valence electron of lithium from its atom, you're going to need a lot more energy than you will need for sodium and potassium, specifically that amount. Now, guys, let's go to potassium. What's happening with potassium? Potassium also has electrons that are attracted towards the nucleus. Now, I want you to look at the valence electron of potassium. That Look at where the nucleus is. Compare the distance between the two. Can you see the distance is quite longer than that of lithium? Now, lithium is a smaller atom. So the distance between the valence electron and the nucleus is shorter. So the force of attraction is stronger. In the case of potassium, the distance is longer. So you're going to have the valence electron, yes, being attracted towards the nucleus, but the force of attraction is going to be less because it's a bit further. So you're going to require energy, ionization energy, but it's going to be less than that of lithium. So when it comes to ionization energies, they decrease down the group. Now out of these three, the one that is most reactive is potassium. Potassium is so highly reactive. Reactivity of metals is tied to how easily they lose their valence electron. To make some money about potassium and ionization energy, it has the lowest because its valence electron is quite far from the nucleus and therefore the force of attraction is weaker. So potassium easily loses its valence electron compared to the other two. 
and therefore it's the one that is most reactive. Okay, guys, so this brings us to the end of part one. So in part two, we are going to discuss physical and chemical properties of alkali metals. See you there.